What is digital health? Access to quality care everywhere. Saving the data we've gained for the future. Maximizing development's impact. Staying healthy our entire lives. To create a society where everyone can access suitable health care. To fight newly emerged diseases and address health care issues. For this and more, new digital health initiatives have begun. Digital Health to achieve universal health coverage or UHC. JICA considers universal health coverage or UHC a priority issue. UHC means providing everyone with health care services of a sufficient quality when they need it and at an affordable price. The Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, also include the achievement of UHC under its third goal. The international community is working to achieve UHC by 2030. However, as of 2017, half the world's population around 3.5 billion people still lacked access to even basic healthcare services. Particularly in rural and remote areas of developing countries, there is a serious shortage of medical professionals, facilities and other resources, while healthcare systems impose a heavy economic burden. These and other factors make it difficult to achieve UHC by 2030 solely through the steady efforts taken thus far. This is where digital health comes in. Its technologies hold great potential. Digital health applies ICT, AI, and other digital technology, as well as various types of data, to assist decision-making by medical professionals and patients, contributing to care, prevention, and better health. On the other hand, with many still struggling to access care under conventional health systems, innovative approaches are needed to achieve the 2030 goal. In other words, digital health can be considered an effective means of helping achieve UHC. A systematic approach for effective intervention with digital health is also necessary. A digital society has layers from social infrastructure to individual applications. These are made up of governments, international organizations, and private companies, which collaborate to fulfill their respective roles. To cover many people, it's important to find the right approach given the institutions and environment in a country, and to employ a means that may allow leapfrogging development. This will help realize UHC. The Potential of Digital Health Japan, a super-aging society, faces many challenges, including medical settings with insufficient resources and ballooning healthcare costs. What's more, the COVID-19 pandemic suddenly drove a greater need for remote and contactless solutions. Meanwhile, government and IT companies across Japan are collaborating to digitalize regional healthcare services. One example is Smart City, Aizu Wakamatsu. With a falling birth rate and aging population, Aizu Wakamatsu City attracts ICT companies to Aikuto, a center to foster industries where young professionals can thrive. The goal is sustainable, participatory urban development for citizens. Mr. Motojima is promoting the smart city from within the government. He says Aizu Wakamatsu's population is declining by 1,000 people a year. The idea is to energize the city with a hub that will attract ICT firms. To a certain extent, we've built a platform for providing the smart city's digital services. We are now entering the stage where we rapidly add services for citizens to use. Citizens can access services 
via the Aizu Wakamatsu Plus portal site. After providing their consent, users can share their personal health data with services. Mr. Fuji from Accenture, a company building this kind of platform, wants to address local issues and improve convenience with digital technology. He says, for example, currently data from hospitals, patients' smartwatches, school health checkups, and company health checkups are not connected. This makes it hard to provide good medical and preventive care. That's why first, we want to work on connecting this data. In Aizu and elsewhere in the Tohoku region, hypertension is a very serious problem, so I want to connect blood pressure gauges with IoT to digitize data so doctors can view it during examinations. Dr. Yatabe is a medical specialist who offers Telemedis, an online examination service for patients with hypertension in Aizu Wakamatsu. He says, I'm going to talk to a patient using an online blood pressure management system now. Are there any changes? The patient responds, the top and bottom numbers are about 30 apart. Is that okay? Overall, I think you're fine. Okay, thank you. The patient made remarks about the service. He says, it makes graphs out of my blood pressure measurements. I can see them myself, and my doctor can look at the same thing. That really reassures me. Dr. Yatabe says that patients with hypertension who require long-term care benefit from avoiding trips to the hospital. He says, some people have to take medication for the rest of their lives. With digital technology and smartphones, we can treat hypertension anytime. Being connected brings huge advantages. As its population ages, Aizu Wakamatsu has introduced Carriel, a communication app to reduce the burden on caregivers. The app shares the daily health data of nursing home residents with their families and specialists and helps with mental health care. <laughs> Ms. Endo says, I think the app has a positive effect on residents because it helps family members communicate with them by offering encouragement to the residents, commenting on their outings and so on. Ms. Han from Sampo Holdings, which provides Carriel, says that a region-wide effort will help spread digital services. She says, we already have around 500 people using it in Aizu Wakamatsu City. That data is very valuable, and we have started integrating with other services in the area. We want to make it into a fundamental communication tool, and we have started first with deployment in Aizu Wakamatsu. The public and private sectors collaborate and carry out their respective roles in Aizu Wakamatsu's digitalization drive. Ms. Sakai from the JICA office for STI and DX says that, like with the smart city, it's effective to clarify areas of cooperation and competition. She says the national government has to effectively build the data and platform layers, like by preparing national citizen IDs and tying medical data to it. This will enable easier access to social security and social services. It will also allow the private sector to start up businesses. That's how we can build the architecture as a whole. Digital health is also coming into increasing use outside Japan. The World Health Organization has established a strategic vision to improve access to healthcare services for everyone, everywhere, by accelerating the use of proper digital health. The vision suggests priority action areas and methods for digital health intervention. And the digital transformation accelerated by the pandemic has rapidly expanded the global digital health market. Major IT companies are entering this market, 
that is forecasted to grow from $289 billion in 2021 to over $881 billion in 2027. And in 2021, investment doubled from the previous year to $44 billion. We can expect greater investment in healthcare startups. Ms. Sakai says, developing countries are fundamentally lacking in human resources, goods, and funds. Providing them with remote medical care and examinations will be hugely beneficial by removing the barriers they've had so far. JICA's top priority is addressing issues in developing countries, so we want to partner with companies that want to roll out businesses in developing countries to solve those problems on the ground. Let's see some examples of digital health in developing countries. Case 1 is a maternal health examination system that uses a smartphone app. JICA previously assigned Mr. Furuta to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Witnessing the issues the society there faces inspired him to start up SOAC and find solutions through business. He says, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is a very large country with a severe lack of infrastructure and an extremely low quality of health services. The mortality ratio of pregnant women is about a hundred times higher than Japan's. Prenatal care is essential to identifying risks during pregnancy. But many pregnant women do not receive an examination due to poor access to healthcare facilities. Another major factor is that people don't see the point in traveling far to receive low-quality care. Mr. Furuta says, the majority of pregnant women who die were not able to visit a healthcare facility, so the biggest question is how we can reach those women and provide access. Mr. Furuta felt that a higher quality of prenatal care was a must to get more pregnant women to receive it. He developed SPAC, which uses smartphones with portable medical equipment, such as ultrasound machines. He says, while the smartphone app is the core component, the package includes a set of internet-connected medical devices. You can use it even without access to power or the internet. During an SPAC digital checkup, a patient is issued a card containing a chip and completes the examination by navigating the steps in the smartphone app. Patient information and checkup results are stored digitally. SPAC sends an alert if there is anything abnormal. Medical facilities that have started using the service have seen a major uptick in the number of pregnant women coming for prenatal checkups. Mr. Furuta says, prenatal checkups have increased by about 50% to 100% over the previous year. When you're pregnant, seeing an image of your baby is a really big deal. Regardless of medical impact, pregnant women need to feel that the checkup is meaningful. It's extremely important to add that value. Mr. Furuta is also trying to help pregnant women in remote areas with little access to care. He says, we are conducting home visits from medical facilities about once a month. Because of this, we can provide the same prenatal care to pregnant women who weren't covered at all before. So far, we have about 30 medical facilities using our service. They've provided about 2,500 prenatal checkups and reported approximately 40 lives saved. Local medical professionals also think highly of SPAC. One person says, thanks to SPAC, we have a lot of women coming for prenatal checkups. The most important thing is, we are reducing the mortality rate for pregnant women and newborns in Congo. 
Mr. Furuta has seen for himself how the maternal mortality ratio has improved in Congo. He aims to further spread SPAC while developing a business model that brings benefits for healthcare workers. He says, the medical facilities that have been proactive in providing house calls have seen their revenues increase considerably, and this led to some increase of payments to healthcare workers. I believe that ensuring profitability for hospitals, the foundation of their operation, is the only way to create a sustainable impact, so I want such cases to increase. Case 2 is an ophthalmic remote diagnosis system. Dr. Kita runs Metis Medical. A case he saw in the winter of his second year as an ophthalmologist led to his involvement in remote diagnosis. He says, when I was working in Hokkaido, an older woman came to me. She had been enduring pain in her eyes for three days. Her eyes required emergency treatment, but when she came to the hospital, it was too late to save them. The woman lived in a village in the mountains far from town, where there was no ophthalmologist. Although she'd visited a doctor at her local clinic, the serious condition of her eyes went unnoticed, because the doctor wasn't a specialist. Dr. Kita says, if an ophthalmologist had seen a simple image or a video of her eyes, she would have been told to visit a specialized eye clinic right away, or even call an ambulance. I began to wonder if ophthalmologists could connect simply with other physicians. Dr. Kita wanted to provide ophthalmic care in places without eye clinics. Working with a medical device maker, he developed the MS-1 mobile diagnostic device. He says, basically, this doesn't have a camera because you use a smartphone's camera. It snaps together like this. I'm going to record. Open a little wider. I'm recording the right eye. An eye is only a little over two centimeters wide, and you view it at six to ten times magnification, so any misalignment reduces focus and visibility. A physician or nurse can use it and record at a certain quality. Then, when the images and the patient's medical data are uploaded to the cloud, a request for diagnosis can be sent to a registered ophthalmologist. Metis Medical began a pilot project in Mongolia in 2019 to turn this into a practical, remote, ophthalmologic diagnosis system. Dr. Kita says, when we first worked in Mongolia, they had around 300 eye doctors for an area four times the size of Japan. Each of them covered more area than anywhere else in the world except for Africa. Each pin on the map shows the location of an ophthalmologist. Most areas have poor access to eye doctors. Metis Medical distributed mobile devices to clinics in a western province of Mongolia to connect them with ophthalmologists in the central area of the province. After seeing over 100 diagnoses a month, Dr. Kita sensed a great need in developing countries. He says, there are 18 villages, and the village farthest away from the province's central hospital is a six-hour car ride away. What made me happiest is that we found a person with the same condition as the woman I met in Hokkaido, but the patient was able to receive treatment and save the eyes. Metis Medical used JICA's program to support SME business to achieve the SDGs in Cambodia, which has only about 50 eye doctors, to conduct a survey on the need for and efficacy of remote diagnosis in out-of-the-way places. Dr. Kita says, around 150 people have been examined, and we have found many patients who require treatment, including a large number of cataract patients. We found that our system can identify such patients and connect them to treatment. Now we're making good use of the knowledge and network we've developed there as we prepare for our next project. Metis Medical is also running pilot projects in Indonesia and Bangladesh to further develop the service. Dr. Kita says, many of the countries we're working in have few ophthalmologists, so even though we can now take images remotely, if there's no doctor to examine the images, 
will get no diagnosis or results. Monetization by arranging a way for the remotely attending physician to earn money or be rewarded for their work is something I don't see anywhere. So doing that has value. That's what we want to try and do. Case 3 is about fighting malaria with drones. Sora Technology is addressing social problems in developing countries from the air. The company is run by Mr. Kaneko, who has experience with drone ventures and JAXA. Soon after starting up the company in 2020, he got to work in Africa. He says, we use drones and other air mobility technologies, but we don't just fly drones. Our company's mission is to help people. We're starting in developing countries where the needs are real, and it's easier to fly drones there because there are few buildings and roads. With the goal of contributing to global health, Sora Technology has joined a project in the West African country of Sierra Leone by the Directorate of Science to deliver medical supplies. Mr. Kaneko says, we concluded an MOU to provide technical assistance and we went there. Then we heard that the project is just amazing, but they don't have medical supplies to transport, and that actually, they are more troubled now by malaria. Malaria is a disease spread through mosquito bites. It causes particularly severe harm in tropical and subtropical developing countries. Malaria killed approximately 620,000 people in 2021. Mosquito larvae grow in puddles of water. The WHO recommends dealing with these puddles as one way to fight malaria. Mr. Kaneko says, I suggested to the health directorate that this is what we should do, but they said the cost performance is terrible. They haphazardly carry insecticides to spread over any puddles they find. That's when Mr. Kaneko thought of something he could do with drones. Sora Malaria Control is a system that spots puddles from the air and analyzes the captured images with AI. The system detects likely larva habitats based on a puddle's size and depth and the vegetation growing there. Mr. Kaneko says, I didn't know at first whether we could do it, but there was a clear need in the community. We could produce solid data about where the high-risk puddles were and where insecticide should be used. In a trial, the system detected risk with 70 to 80% accuracy. Next, Mr. Kaneko wants to leverage JICA's business support program for SMEs adopted in February 2023, gather data and increase accuracy, and roll out the program in other countries facing the same problem. He says, I think we can use the seeds of development that we found in Sierra Leone in other countries too. We plan to gradually spread to Senegal and other countries in West and Central Africa. Mr. Kaneko wants to make a global contribution. He says developing countries have real challenges and needs, and therefore the impact is greater. He says, if we bring technology to medicine, a respected field that is Japan's strength, local people will appreciate it, and we can deploy Japanese technology. Plus, the local data will be quite necessary for further development and become an investment for the next generation. Drones are no more than a starting point. I believe that this is the first step in digitizing the entire healthcare system. We can't do it alone, so I want to work with other partners to bring digital health to developing countries. Mr. Koshiba has long been involved in supporting new business development and policy making in the field of global health. He says that a meticulous, user-centric approach is essential to promoting the spread of digital health. 
に予防領域に関しては、explained, digital health is expected to have a great impact, especially in preventive care. But from a behavioral science perspective, how can we encourage people to actually use our solutions? I think organizations and personnel, such as JICA and other Japanese stakeholders, who have been carefully working closely with local people, will play a very important role in making this happen. Once the infrastructure is in place, the question will become what solutions the private sector and public private partnerships will create on top of it. I hope we'll work with local communities to create new solutions in emerging and developing countries. I think Japan has plenty of potential there to work with local stakeholders. Innovation through digital technology is accelerating globally. In the not too distant future, we'll likely see digital health make people happy around the world. By overcoming economic, physical, and other types of barriers, people living on remote islands and out of the way areas will gain access to the medical services they need. For example, using individual IDs and digitalized health data will lead to progress in healthcare. Patients will receive individually customized care and advice based on their comprehensive personal health information. And using wearable device data and other big data will likely lead to streamlined, faster development of new drugs and medical devices. For example, medical settings that suffer from chronic shortages of resources will benefit from an optimized medical system that reduces the burden on medical professionals and provides a stress free work environment. This will realize a diverse society free of barriers where everyone can expand opportunities for their careers, education, and daily life. Digital health will change the future. JICA will leverage digital health to contribute to achieving UHC.